Welcome to Saltier Politics this week in isolation. Julie, how is isolation going for you? Fantastic. Really? I I showered today. Oh, there you go. That was a big deal. People are saying for increased productivity to put work pants on and not wear sweatpants. How do you feel about that? Uh, This is why I'm doing this from the neck up. I'm wearing, I'm not wearing sweatpants. I'm wearing here, I'll show you. I'm wearing these like, (laughs) they're not sweatpants. They're like elastic pants. Okay, well, we need comfort. Did you ever watch Seinfeld? Did you you ever see that episode where they're like, if you wear sweatpants, you've basically given up? Yes. That's, yeah, I've basically given up. It's not sweatpants. It's worse than sweatpants. It's fake, like, pleathery type elastic waistband pants. Did you know that you would also become a teacher? How is that going? A what? A teacher. How? Oh, well, it's not going yet because um, it's still officially um, spring break in the second grade. Ah, but starting next Monday, yes, I will be homeschooling. And let me tell you something. Enough of this common core math. This kid is going to learn how to carry the one. He's yes. going to learn all sorts of crap that they're not allowed to teach right now that I'm going to make sure he teaches, he learns. So it's, going to be dark, it's going to be a dark day for him. That's going to be amazing. Okay. So yeah. something that you tweeted out on Twitter was absolutely perfect. It was about um, the Italian mayor's losing their mind in the best way possible awesome it makes me i've always said i'm kind of secretly italian in every way and this except i can't cook and this underscores exactly why i am so desperate to be italian it's fantastic (laughs) my favorite is where the guy goes getting in mobile hairdressers what the f is that for do you understand that the casket will be closed who the f is supposed to even see you with your hair all done in the casket it's not as good if you watch an Italian. It's so true. the guy's going ballistic, and it's great. It's true. It's great. How did you find these Italian mayors just going off? Because it's it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, somebody tweeted it out, and I can I this is all I've done. This is what I've done all day. By the way, two weeks ago I had a productive business and a productive life. This is all I've been doing all morning. I changed oh. the sheets on my bed, which is a huge, huge undertaking. Can we talk well, about what's going on in this country? Yeah, let me t- tell me some of the things that you've been seeing um, just walking around in New York and in general. So what I've been walking around seeing in New York is Central Park was packed yesterday. We went for a big walk, like a five-mile walk, and uh, playgrounds were packed, which I don't get. These kids are on the playgrounds, and they're holding on to these metal and plastic um accoutrement on the playground so it's pretty bad it's not great and weren't you sick recently and weren't able to get a test i was sick so i um i haven't talked about this but yes about i would say 10 days ago or so um my i started feeling really achy which was okay whatever happens but then i developed this very dry cough and i was like okay that's kind of weird and then my lungs started to hurt when I inhaled deeply. So then I said, okay, you know what? I'm going to walk over to my city MD and I'm going to just ask to see what they have to say. So I did. And the doctor, they gave me a mask and then they took my um, temperature. I didn't have a fever, which was the only symptom I didn't have. But I did have everything else. So the guy said, well, yeah, it sounds like it. It probably is, but we're not going to give you a test because we don't have enough of them and you're not in the dangerous age bracket and that I was, I'm not 60 or above. And also I don't have any preexisting conditions, which is a good thing. So he basically told me to just go home and self isolate, which is fine. Um, except for the fact that of course we have a president who said anybody who wants a test can get one. I could not get one to save my life. Um, and so I did go home and I did self isolate and I did cough, um, and, and pretty badly, I would say for probably about a week. Um, and then I uh, started to feel better and better, and I'm feeling better now. I still have a little bit of a cough, and I still have a little bit um, of a, like when I inhale, my lungs still hurt a little bit. But all when all is said and done, not too bad. If I did have it, I have no idea whether I did or I didn't. The part that stinks is, of course, that since I don't know whether I had it or didn't have it, I had to send my son off to his grandparents um, in New Jersey. And, well, I was going to do that anyway because it was spring break, but I... Pretty much didn't see anybody or do anything. There you go. All right. Well, I last weekend was in Florida in the villages. You kill everybody there because, of course, they are all very susceptible. They are very well. 
it wasn't taken seriously because on Saturday evening, I went to a St. Patrick's Day party. And now the entry to this party was a shot of whiskey. And then mm. they sprayed you with water uh, and said, coronavirus, coronavirus uh, vaccine. And then you got into the party with about... This is in the villages? The villages, yes. With about well, 20... Wait, wait, wait. This is how a retirement community parties. They give you shots of whiskey and then they spray you with coronavirus, like holy water? Yes. Um, okay. Those who don't know, the villages is a the villages is basically the reason Florida goes red correct. during federal elections. It is a huge, huge, huge retirement community. I don't know how many people am like tens uh, of thousands, right? Yes, and they I I mentioned to some of them. I'm like my really good friend uh, Julie Ruginski. She we have saltier politics pol- podcast, and they're like, I recognize her. They're all very big Fox fans. They're huge Fox fans. I know it's been a while since I they, they've seen me on Fox, but um, but that's interesting that they're partying like they're they're in spring break, but they're in the villages. Yes, and also Florida. I've seen you've seen the shots of people on the beaches. So I I think people being careless are going to screw it up for the rest of us who are taking it seriously, and have these shelter in place or have these just inability to go for a run outside, which would Do be you awful. you describe their carelessness to the fact that the president and his media enablers have really been downplaying the threat of this and that they think this is just some sort of plot or hoax to get Donald Trump to tank the economy? Like, what did you hear? I'm, I'm dying to hear what people in the villages, again, who are vastly conservative, older, uh, in a swing state, what they have to say about all of this? What did they say? Well, I went back this weekend and what a week has done, uh, which I think a lot of the conversation has shifted in the seriousness because a week and a half ago, President Trump wasn't quite as serious about the severity of this as he is now. And now right. they're concerned. Now now it's, you know, the Publixes, the grocery stores here, are the shelves are empty with sanitizer. So yes, that mattered. And you could see in people's actions. One one week ago, it was all party. Now people are very much in their homes and worried. So that does do a really big impact. And Julie, I wanted to ask you about um, what you think of this spending, uh, the coronavirus spending bill. Well, I think it's, I think it's not. Well, I have a couple, a couple of issues with it. One is the bill, as it was originally presented by Mitch McConnell, gave Steve Mnuchin slash Donald Trump almost exclusive authority to dole out over a trillion dollars, which is absurd um, because you and I both know that the first place that's going to get bailed out is the Trump um, organization and all their friends. Um, there weren't enough protections to make sure it was actually going to the people who needed it to go to. And secondly, I have a really big problem with safeguards not being put in place to bail out companies that used their flush um, economic times to buy back stock options or to give pay raises to their executives rather than putting it, investing it back in the business and making sure that they were going to able to, to, to not just hire people, but then to keep people on payroll um, during this time. I mean, buying back stock options is great, but then don't come begging the taxpayer for money um, because you don't have the ability or the cash flow to be able to sustain this um, if it goes on much longer. You have companies like Starbucks and others who uh, here are now paying their workers for 30 days, regardless of whether those workers are showing up to work or not. That's great. Um, I have a really big problem bailing out the airline industry, and I, I have an even bigger problem, and I'm you know, old enough to remember the crash in 2008. I never talked about this, but I was on a very interesting call in 2008. I was working for Senator Lautenberg, um, Frank Lautenberg, who's since passed away. And right when the crash happened in September of 08, um, I happened to be with him and he was asked to get on a conference call with the rest of the Democratic conference, the rest of the Democratic senators. Um, and so he gets on and he puts it on speaker. And this is what I hear. I hear that uh, Harry Reid was the Senate minority leader, majority leader. I can't remember if they were in the majority at the time. I think he was the minority leader. Um, and um, it was um, the chairman of the Fed. Ben Bernanke at the time, and uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, who was the Secretary of Treasury, who was the former chairman of Goldman Sachs, of course. Um, And uh, they both get on the phone and they basically tell these senators, if you don't give us this blank check bailout, all of you are going to 
lose all your money in the market. And uh, so, of course, they all signed off on it. And we know what happened, which is that all these companies got bailed out, all these banks got bailed out um, and proceeded to not just prosper, but to do better than ever while creating a too big to fail structure that was even worse than before 2008. I mean, let's just say that the banking industry today, despite all the safeguards that have been put in place, does not provide the kind of safeguards that needed to be provided to avoid another calamity. Uh, they have now become even bigger um, and therefore even more too big to fail. Um, that's really troubling to me. And it's troubling to me if we do this again in the throes of, oh, my God, we don't bail out these airlines or we don't bail out these banks or we don't bail, bail out these huge corporations. Don't you understand you're not bailing out their CEOs, you're bailing out their workers. If they shut down, then all the workers who work there are out of business. That's true. On the other hand, those workers need help now. And these corporations have already shown themselves to be using taxpayer funded bailout money, not to necessarily improve the lives of their employees and, and their workers, but to use it for stock buybacks, for, for executive compensation, for mergers that will allow them to become even bigger and more powerful and create even more of a not legal monopoly because those aren't legal, but even more of a monopolistic structure. And so I am committed to making sure that this is not what happens. You don't just give Steve Mnuchin a blank piece of paper and say, we trust you, Steve Mnuchin, we trust you, Donald Trump, God bless, go bail it out. Right. Um, you only need to look at the tax plan of a couple of years ago to understand how self-serving it is. Um, the help that it gives to real estate companies like the Trump Organization, like the Kushner companies, is outsized compared to what it does for anybody else. Um, in some place, some cases, in some places, people like me who live in New York and have to not be able to deduct salt taxes anymore are actually much worse off um, with this tax plan than we were before it got enacted. So I, I just I want to be very very clear and very very sure that this is not yet another giveaway in the panic of trying to do something that we do something that actually sets us up for failure, not just down the road, but in the next day or two or five. That's a really important message for people to hear. Um, also what has been bothering me with the whole, with the coronavirus and kind of the politicization of it is so Trump has been sued for allowing meals on wheels and homeless shelters to discriminate against LGBTQ people. The organizations are taking the Trump ad administration to court because of a religious exemption rule that puts LGBTQ people at risk during this epidemic. So it's not so great. You tell, you tell me, wait a second, because I, I need to hear this because that's you, right? That's right. somebody like you. Um, right. Tell me what tell me what this would mean practically for you or for any LGBTQ person who relies on meals on wheels. It obviously means nothing for you because you don't rely on it. But let's say you were, um, uh, I don't know, a, an 85-year-old lesbian woman who's homebound and you relied on Meals on Wheels. How does this affect you? They actually, How do they know that you're LGBTQ? So it allows recipients of the federal grants to discriminate against people like me so I wouldn't be able to get a crucial meal if I needed it. Um, so they can say, hey, you know what, you're a lesbian and, and so we're not going to deliver food to you because you should starve? In short, so, yes. So this is great because you know who these people are. These are all people who are all about Jesus and all about um, religion. And now they're basically saying, hey, I don't really care. You go starve to death because you uh, live a quote unquote lifestyle that I don't agree with. Right. And which then, is a translation. You, you were born a certain way. Right. And then the Trump administration argued that the goal was to, quote, eliminate the regulatory burden, including burden on the free exercise of religion. <laughs> is oh, like, what is your like like which religion allows you to subject somebody to starvation i don't think that's in the new or old testament but you don't don't consider yourself a good human being i mean there's a lot of things in the old or new testament that uh people find objectionable right i mean we're like, cotton like, as well but, so like if you quote leviticus which is all about you know things that these evangelicals always quote you know what else you're not allowed to do in leviticus Eat, eat bacon. That would be all, so, you know, that would so, be all the people. That would be all the Americans. So that would be everybody who likes their Sunday ham. This this is something that has been making me very salty. Um, Can I ask you this? How do you, I mean, 
because this is all very intellectual for me, obviously. But how do you, like you're a 30 year old woman who's done everything right in your life, literally, like everything your parents wanted you to do, you did. You studied hard, you got into a really good college, you have a good job, you are a good human being. Um, and here you have a government officially allowing you to be discriminated against because you happen to be born gay. I mean, it's like something I can't change. I have to say viscerally, how would that make, I just, I can't even grasp it. Right. I mean, one of my friends, when I was first coming out was telling me, Emily, it's a party. Can you change the color of your eyes? You can't like, and now it's somebody who's discriminating against you for the something you were born with something for you no more than people eyes. are no more than people can help the color of their skin that they're born it's not even a religion that you can i guess choose to be you know you could be born into the jewish religion or the muslim or the catholic or whatever religion and you could choose not to abide by it but explain to me how you get to um choose to not be gay anymore so you can get your meals on wheels you, you can't like you, you can't I mean, do you have to now lie i i like and and then it gets in the whole thing well look it was a choice it's not it's it's not you can't you can't make a decision to change your eye color you can't make a decision to change how you were born um trust me if it could be i don't speaking for myself i don't i my life would be a lot easier if i could date men and it was when I was trying to stay in the closet. I didn't get the same outside negativity, but internally I was a complete mess because I wasn't being true to myself and who I was. Yeah. Every single friend I have who's um, gay or a lesbian says the same. I mean, every single one says the same thing. If they could have changed it, they would have because it was so hard growing up and going to high school and coming out to their family and living this dual life and, and struggling with it and, and all the choices that they felt they had to make. Um, and then to have the federal government effectively say, well, it's still a choice and therefore you could either choose to live a different life that is completely antithetical to who you are or starve to death is quite a message to be sending. And every time I think we've come so far in this on this topic because I remember how happy I was when marriage equality was finally made legal and I remember turning to my friend Bill, who's gay, and saying, you know, unlike the civil rights movement with race or anything, or even, you know, the, the, the feminist movement, this seemed to go from zero to 100 so quickly. We went from running a campaign in 2004 on the Bush administration side that was all about stopping, as they called it, gay marriage in Ohio, um, to suddenly a decade later, marriage equality being legalized. And thinking, my God, you know, in the last decade, how, how far we've come as this quantum jump, only to realize that was such a naive way to look at it. It was such an awfully naive way for me to look at it, because the reality is, of course not. You have a new administration coming in, you have a new president coming in, who puts in all these rules that effectively say, oh, sorry, sorry, if you're gay, right, you won't get food. And by the way, this is Meals on Wheels. This isn't like some extra credit thing that you don't need. This is literally providing meals to people who are homebound. I mean, I don't know if people understand that Meals on Wheels is an incredibly um, it's basic, basic, I mean, uh, God, it's, it's administered through counties and state governments. It's an incredibly um, fundamental program that people that people take advantage of. And these are people who are in dire, dire, dire need. They're homebound. They cannot go out and get a meal themselves, which is why the meals come to them um, and are delivered to them. And these are not people who have the means to go call Amazon Prime and have Amazon Prime deliver, you know, a steak to their door um, or to have takeout from some restaurant delivered to their door. These are people living more than paycheck to paycheck um, in ill health and in old age. And to say that these people who have because of their age, gone through hell if they're gay um, in ways, Emily, that I think even, you know, somebody in your situation never has had to because these are people who are probably in their 70s and 80s. I can only imagine what it was like in the 40s and 50s. 
having to live this lie. Most of them probably had to marry somebody of the opposite sex to, you know, keep up appearances and have children and then belatedly come out of the closet to their families. Um, to make, to, to have them now when they're also facing a crisis and a health scare that will probably kill them if it infects them because they're old and their immune systems are, are compromised to have them be discriminated against because of their sexual orientation. It's just, it's, it's, it's not just, it's like the cruelty is the point. People keep saying that, but it's the cruelty is the feature. It's not a bug of this right. administration. Um, and I don't care how religious you are. That is an absolutely cruel thing to do to somebody. Just awful. It's, it's awful. And anybody who supports it, I, I like, right. you know, and it's like, it's, it's also just, you have to be missing a lack of empathy because it's not like I woke up one morning and was like, I want to make my life more difficult and I want to have to, every relationship I have, have to announce to people and come out. I feel like every time I meet someone, I have to come out. It's not like... That's a, interesting. It's not a fun conversation that- all the time because you have to always like weigh the person. Even even Julie, like you're my one of my closest friends and I didn't tell you right away because it was just yeah. like, I felt like I have to prove myself as I just, I have this ability where I just need to prove myself before I come out to somebody, especially you know my early. Friend, you know, my friend Ben, you've met my friend Ben, who's like my little brother. Yeah. Um, so he's gay. And I think I was the first person he came out to, but he came out to me, I don't, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. He's a, he's a, um, 39. So I think he probably came out when he was in his, his mid to late twenties to me. And I had known him. Um, he was actually my intern, um, when I worked in the Senate back in 2000, 2001. So, I mean, this is how long I've known him for, uh, but about 10 or 12 years ago, he came out to me and I, he said, and I kind of suspected, but I wasn't really sure. And he said to me, I just want to let you know, this is before marriage equality is legal. He goes, you know, I'm never going to be able to get married. And I was like, what? You'll meet somebody. That's crazy. Why would you say that? And he goes, no, no, it's, you know, I'm not allowed to get married because I'm gay. And I kind of looked at him. I said, OK, I'm straight. And I said it kind of as a joke to be like, it's not a like, it's not a big deal. You're gay. I'm straight. Like, let's not, you know. And he got kind of annoyed at me and I didn't realize why. I thought I was actually doing the right thing and trying to downplay it. Um, and I understand why now, not now, but I shortly thereafter understood. It was such a huge deal for him to say it to me or to anybody. Um, whereas to me saying, oh yeah, haha, ha, I'm straight. It's not a huge deal. People just assume, right? They just assume that you are unless you say right. otherwise. Um, and it's not the same thing. It's not the same for me to have to, I don't walk around saying, Oh God, you know, I just met you. There's something I need to know. Um, I need you to meet my significant other and God, I don't know how you're going to take this, but my significant other is a man. Um, I know how they're going to take it. It's going to be just fine. Of course, my significant other is a man. Um, in your case, people would assume that of course your significant other is a man as well. And you have to go through this whole thing of telling them that it's a woman, but you know, I have to say, why does it matter? Exactly. It's, I don't think it does, but right. it's just... Somebody who knows your significant other, she's effing awesome, and I love her. And so I don't know why this is something that needs to be made a big deal of, other than I hope somebody meets somebody as, often, as awesome as your girlfriend, man or woman, in their life, because right. she's great. Right. And it just... Right. It makes everybody happier but it's just the empathy thing I wish that people who don't have probably do have a family members but is afraid to come out but just think about it put yourself in that situation and no one wants to make their life more difficult so cutting off I don't, an HHS, but I don't get like when you come out does that make it feel like when you meet a new person why do you feel the need to to make a production out of it other than to say, hey, I, like, at which point do you tell them when you talk about your personal life? Well, right. When, when that comes up, like when they're like, oh, by the way, you must have a boyfriend. Let me just I guess when people want to just get to know you. But it's also a safety thing, too, because I'm I'm from Florida in a conservative area in Florida. And you see sometimes things aren't taken well or that you're going to be treated differently. And, you know, I don't want to be treated differently. I when wanted, was the last time somebody that you met who thought you were really awesome said to you, 
you you told them that you have a girlfriend or you told them that you're gay and they're they just you felt like they were just kind of shunting you to the side or not treating you the way you thought that they would treat you has was, anybody really disappointed you people people who you assume i'm not talking about family members because that's different but i'm talking about like strangers that you've met that you said this is going to be a really awesome person to get to know you tell them and then they proceed to treat you differently has that happened to you um no a guy who i dated in high school was weird about it but oh my god he was probably so excited this is like every guy's fantasy to have right. a high school high school right. girl <laughs> okay so <laughs> every but, single straight guy i know is like wait really my right. girlfriend became gay that's awesome well they think it's like a, you? he's telling all his guy friends all this stuff well he think it's like a he makes it him less than because okay. yeah so that didn't but i mean so he, he turned you gay Right, it's like definitely well, that's if confirmed you, if it. You were, if you were a little bit more skilled, right? Sure, you probably would have made a different decision in life. Exactly. It's bad it that is, he turns off all men. Right, is his fault. Um, it is his fault. But yeah, yeah. His, uh, his current girlfriend's probably exploring her options now. <laughs> right. So it's. It, I guess it's. It's just the fear of being accepted or being treated differently, and I guess one of the fears also because I did sports for so long was like I wouldn't want all the like in the locker rooms, other people to feel weird around me. Cause you know, I don't know. It was just something that was in my head that like people would feel weird around me. They didn't want that. I, what I don't understand is it's like people saying that um, they don't want to use the same bathrooms because of people who are LG or people who are trans because God forbid they're going to get to like, I could use a men's room all day, every day. Right. And I'm not going to feel compelled to check out any man who's using the bathroom. Right. It's just not something that's in my DNA. And I don't think it's in most people's DNA. No, it's not. I think a predator is a predator and it doesn't matter who you are. So. Exactly. <laughs> wow. But, well, you know what? Since this is saltier politics, um, but this is a very unusual time and it's a very um, depressing time for a lot of people. Why don't we table our usual what's making us salty and discuss what's making you happy? Today. Well, what's making me happy is I'm still in Florida and I get to go outside on a very long run in 82 degree red weather today. Okay. Uh, you're still in Florida. So I would still say to you, you have the short end of the stick on that one. Um, I'll tell you what's making me happy. So this is something that happens once a year for a very brief period of time. I don't know if you could see behind me, you could see the window behind me, but there is a magnolia tree um, that's outside my window and it blooms for probably, I don't know, two weeks, three, three weeks of that every year. And then it dies and fall, the leaves fall and it's about to burst. And every day I kind of look at it and every day it's just getting closer and closer and closer. And I'm super excited because any day now, hopefully tomorrow or the day after it's going to bloom and I actually get to be home to watch it and to take it in. And I don't mean to sound cheesy, but this is the kind of stuff that I never have time to really pay attention to when I'm running around every day. And now I have time to sit there and look at it. And I've been looking at it a lot um, for the last week or so. And it's almost there. So I'm super excited. It's going to be beautiful. It rained really hard in New York today. So maybe that'll speed things along. And so maybe by the time we speak tomorrow or the day after, since we have all the time in the world to do this podcast now, it's going to be hopefully in full bloom. And I'll take a picture and I'll send it out on Twitter. Yeah, that'll be our next saltier politics. When the magnolia tree blooms. Well, I don't know. That could be a week or two from now. Who knows? But we'll keep know. a live live track of it. All right. This was an awesome episode, Julie. Till All next right. time, stay healthy and safe. You too. Bye.